Hello and welcome to Why Make, where we talk with makers from different disciplines about what inspires them to make. And please help support the Why Make podcast and Why Make Productions by making a tax-deductible donation to us. Go to the Donate to Why Make page on why-make.com. This episode is part of our visual podcast series, where we color in what our guests are talking about with images of their work and images of work that inspired them. This first episode is from our in-depth conversation with the artist Wendy Murayama, a furniture maker, sculptor, and retired educator who resides in San Diego, California. Wendy's work has tackled a wide scope of topics from traditional furniture forms to exploring her Japanese heritage and the imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II to the issues of endangered species. This is a condensed version of the full conversation we had. If you would like to hear the full audio version, please go to the podcast page of our website. I was born with a uh, hearing deficiency. I'm about 80% deaf. And I also have cerebral palsy, which um, has not limited me too much, but it does affect my motor control. And then there's the Asian identity. I probably didn't even know I was Asian until grade school, when people were asking me uh, if I was Chinese or Japanese, and I would have to call home and ask mom, are we Chinese or Japanese? Uh, that's what I realized, you know, being Asian was, was a thing. And then, of course, I identify as a, being a maker, and uh, that's a huge one for me. Um, I'm very proud to be a maker, I'm very proud to be a craft person. And I'm, I'm fortunate that I have that to, I guess it's kind of a form of therapy, maybe. Oh, and being a woman, that's what, another one. I don't hard to believe, isn't it? I can't even believe that's a big deal now, you know? My first piece of furniture happened when I was um, 19. I was taking a craft class at a junior college that was in San Diego called Southwestern College. And they had an excellent craft program. And this would be the 70s. So I think uh, craft was really enjoying a huge revival at that time. And so I was taking jewelry and ceramics and the craft class, we didn't really have a woodworking program, but we had a craft class, which introduced us to all sorts of things like batik and textiles, and woodworking was the final project. And I was really intrigued by the fact that, you know, I was able to use the machines and the other good thing was that the woman that was teaching craft also made furniture, so it was kind of like, wow, you know? Uh, I transferred from Southwestern to San Diego State. Now, Larry Hunter was my teacher there, and he was the one that kind of exposed me to a lot of makers at the time. Uh, but we had some really amazing woodworkers in California, too. Larry Hunter being one of them, and uh, Jack Rogers Hopkins, who I think is greatly uh, underappreciated. But my main influence at that time was Tommy Simpson. Uh, I was really just wowed by Tommy's work at that time, you know, it was so sculptural, and it wasn't really about woodworking, it was more about fantasy forms that one could make, 
Well, let me tell you, the assignments that I got was so totally different from what most of us uh, are familiar with. And you have to remember, this is the early 70s. Uh, one assignment was to go out into the woods and be with nature. And look around and see, find something beautiful that was natural. I'm thinking about it now, it sounds so crazy. I decided to make a music stand or a book stand and I wanted to emulate a way of stare. You know when a way of reaches in the ocean and it dives and you see that beautiful tail coming up? Well, the upper part of my bookstand had a lamp and the tail was really part of that that lamp. I've always loved Charles Rennie Macintosh chairs. Um I love the tall back chairs. And I loved Disneyland as a kid. I wanted to take two iconic uh, images and put it into one piece. And that's how Mickey Macintosh was born. One of my favorite memories was having one of those Mickey Mouse hats where you would have these big black uh, mouse ears. I thought to myself that would be kind of interesting uh, to mash up the two things into one piece. I was drinking coffee and I put the coffee cup down and it made like a ring on top of my drawing. And I thought, oh my god, that looks good. <laughs> so I'm gonna put brown ears in and that's how that happened. The turning Japanese series uh, the men in kimonos were, came from my first trip to Japan in 1992, maybe, I can't remember, but I'd never been to Japan until uh, the early 90s, and like anybody else, I was just amazed by what I was seeing over there, especially as a craft person. There's such a strong craft heritage in Japan. And then, of course, going to downtown Tokyo in the Shibuya district, I mean, there's all this neon stuff. It was very much like Blade Runner, clearly based on Tokyo. And there were these two very different aspects of Japan. There was a little bit of conflict too, you know, there, I'd be riding on the subway and I'd see, see these Japanese businessmen reading the pornographic uh, cartoons, mm -hmm. it was called manga. Such a flurry of uh, images and uh, so I think some of that work was mostly my personal response to what I saw in Japan and uh, I realized that I didn't fit in even though I was Japanese American, Japanese descent, I did not fit into that whole culture. Maybe that was kind of a, a mixture of sadness and relief. I started this body of work when I was an artist in residency at SUNY New York. SUNY purchased, I mean. I n knew that I needed to do this work, but I wasn't really ready until then. I mean, it's just a very hard topic because my mother's side of the family was deeply impacted by Executive Order 9 on the just because they were in Los Angeles at the time when Pearl Harbor was bombed and, and all that happened. But what struck me and kind of made me sort of angry is I was really surprised at 
how many people didn't even know about this episode in American history. Executive Order 906 has happened in this country, the country of freedom, you know, and all that. Um, it was, uh, I just needed to really bring that to the forefront with my work. And I also wanted to get to know more of the Japanese American community. And I would host these uh, tag writing parts and we would have different uh, chores in for each tag. And the only way I was going to be able to do 120,000 tags was to make it a community project but hopefully make it a, um, an educational project and also a social advocacy project. I love animals more than people. People <laughs> are just awful. <laughs> and, uh, I started reading too many articles about the demands of um, the elephant in particular, poaching uh, for the ivory, and it's not only just the elephants, but the uh, rhinoceros and tigers, and all uh, for the sake of uh, being able to show off somebody's wealth. And, uh, the elephant population was really precariously dropping to the point where they were in danger of becoming extinct. So I wanted to, um, do a whole series of work that kind of highlighted this issue. I had to figure out, out a way to make them big without making them heavy and difficult. Man, and so I came up with the idea of making them out of very thin pieces of wood and sewing them together. I guess it's like a form of origami, creating volume with these very flat surfaces. So that, that was how that work came about. After doing Executive Order 906, the elephant project, I, I was kind of beat up emotionally. I needed to do some work that was not heavy. I needed to go back to using color again in a very pleasant way. It was an invitation to a show that got me started on color field pieces. Um, somebody in Colorado was having an exhibition of Bauhaus-inspired furniture. Problem was, I hated Bauhaus furniture. It wasn't really my thing, but I loved uh, Annie Albers, who was a weaver with the Bauhaus movement. So, and she had a wonderful use of color, and so I modeled my work after Annie Albers. And that's why they became two-dimensional, because the weaving they, they were inspired by. The memory piece I did about my aunt has a black lacquered mirror that goes from completely reflective to it becomes very distorted at the very end to where you don't recognize yourself anymore. And I think black mirrors have a lot of meaning. Uh, you know, the iPhone is, is a black mirror, it's a black mirror to technology. And in Japan, this is interesting because I think I need a black mirror. The, the geisha woman in Japan, as they aged, began to use black lacquer as a mirror because the black lacquer kind of made your wrinkles go away. You couldn't see the wrinkles, so you, you know, the process of aging is sort of disguised in the black mirror. 
the whole black music series is just about it can mean depth. Thanks for taking the time to view this Why Make production. To learn more about the Why Make project, please go to our website, why-make.com. 